Thomas A. Lenz is a partner in Atkinson, Andelson, Lawyer, Rood, and Romo, A-A-L-R-R, -R, a leading full-service firm with over 180 attorneys in nine offices in California. Mr. Lenz handles all aspects of labor and employment law issues and heads the firm's traditional labor and National Labor Relations Board practices. He works with employers in all major industries across California and the West. Mr. Lenz served as chair of the Labor and Employment Section for the California Lawyers Association, formerly the State Bar of California, during the 2017-2018 term. He serves as a lecturer in law teaching at the USC Gould School of Law. Visit AALRR.com for further information on the firm. Hello, everyone. I am Tom Lenz. I am a partner in the Atkinson Andelson Law Firm, and I'm pleased to present today's NLRB Labor Law Update for the Center for Continuing Education and I will be talking about a variety of labor law issues arising under the National Labor Relations Act as enforced by the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, changing slides, this is a webinar for the Center for Continuing Education, and it's my pleasure to be back recording with CCE. Moving on to the next slide, uh, in this session, our topics are several. Uh, the National Labor Relations Board, or NLRB, and recent activity, decisions of the National Labor Relations Board, memoranda, rules, and policies which the National Labor Relations Board as a federal agency has issued, and a reminder that change is a constant in the field of labor law affecting the private sector, uh, which the National Labor Relations Board covers, uh, there is a variety of changes, uh, always from uh, administration to administration, and uh, politics, while I'm not going to uh, take any particular positions, are always a factor in terms of the development of these areas of law. And over 30 years of practice, I have seen that certain rules go back and forth depending upon who is in charge, and that is something that we need to keep in mind as we advise our clients and represent them. Moving on to the next slide, uh, an overview about the National Labor Relations Board for those who may not be familiar with the agency. I had the pleasure and privilege to work at the NLRB straight out of law school, and I spent about three and a half years there at the downtown Los Angeles office, and my job was to investigate and prosecute cases and to run workplace elections. And fundamental to what the National Labor Relations Board does in enforcing the National Labor Relations Act is to protect the rights of employees under Section 7. Section 7 is the fundamental uh, set of rights employees have to engage in activities relating to unions, to engage in activity for mutual aid and protection on wages, hours, and terms and conditions of employment, as well as to refrain from such activity. So you have a right to say, yes, I want a union, yes, I want to engage in concerted activity, or no, I do not want to engage in such activities. The National Labor Relations Board has two principal functions in light of those rights to enforce the law, to ensure that workers can freely exercise their rights under Section 7 without interference from employers or unions, as well as to hold secret ballot elections where workers can choose whether or not to have union representation. Moving on to the next slide, here is a uh, chart which uh, reflects the current composition of NLRB offices, and while I'm not going to go through this chapter and verse, you can see uh, that there are various layers simply to headquarters uh, at the National Labor Relations Board, and then if you look on the right, you'll see regional offices. In California, we have four different regional offices. There are over 30 regional offices across the country. Uh, at the top of the chart, you'll see the board, which is uh, a, a group of five persons appointed by the president and typically confirmed by the Senate, 
And uh, depending upon who is president, you will see three of the president's party and two of the other party uh, in composing the board. They uh, create regulations, but uh, more frequently they are involved in deciding cases and perhaps overturning precedent that um, may have existed in the past. And we see from one administration to another that the board is um, changing the rules. Uh, we saw that under the Obama administration, we see that now under the Trump administration, and we will presumably see that again as uh, another administration in the future uh, comes into play. Uh, the general counsel is an attorney appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate who oversees the day-to-day -day operations and policy development of the agency. Uh, the general counsel has oversight uh, over all of the offices in California, uh, which have their respective regional directors, but the general counsel really comes up with a lot of important things that will affect the cases that we handle uh, perhaps more directly than, than anything. I want to talk about some noteworthy decisions as we move to the next slide. and. Uh, First on the list here, and uh, I, I'm not necessarily going in terms of um, in any particular order in these cases other than what is in the PowerPoint, but I, I'm going to cover a number of topics. And uh, the all state maintenance case is a very important case in terms of understanding Section 7 rights. Um, when we talk about employee rights under Section 7 uh, and being something beyond mere um, activity in support of or in opposition to a labor union, uh, there has uh, been a long-standing rule allowing employees to engage in concerted activity, and that has protection, where employees, let's say, uh, have a demand over uh, their pay, or uh, they have a safety concern and they express uh, some sort of uh, concern about that. Well, uh, the Allstate case deals with uh, the threshold issue of whether certain employee activity is protected. Employees complained about uh, a customer that was coming who the previous uh, time around had not given good tips in their opinion, and this related directly to their compensation uh, since it was uh, involving tips. And uh, the National Labor Relations Board took the view that when employees complained and faced repercussions in terms of discipline for those complaints, uh, the Labor Board said that was not protected concerted activity, even though the collective term we was used in connection with the um, the complaints about the, the customer and uh, the lack of adequate tips. So uh, this is a, a change in the law to the extent that uh, the use of terms such as we or our uh, were considered pretty much inherently concerted and would confer protection on uh, activity that might later follow uh, when employees uh, perhaps withhold work or engage in some sort of protest. The Labor Board looked at this in terms of griping, in terms of expressing uh, dissatisfaction, but uh, they also uh, looked at this in terms of uh, perhaps developing more of a factual context. And so you'll see, you know, without me reading the entire slide, that uh, the Labor Board uh, said they're not going to uh, just immediately presume because something was said in a group or that someone used the words we or our, that that will be concerted to have protection. Uh, so for practitioners, I think the lesson from Allstate is be mindful of all the facts, uh, the context in which activity arises concerning wages, hours, and working conditions. It will not be presumed to be concerted or protected simply because there is a group of employees who may have the same concern or an individual employee uses the words we or our. I'm going to switch gears now on a different issue. Uh, on the next slide, Raymond Interior Systems. This is an important case because uh, when we speak of union representation, 
uh, as regulated by the National Labor Relations Act, it is a question of majority rule in most cases. There is a slightly different rule in the construction industry because a construction employer may not know how many employees it needs. It may need to go to a union uh, or other resource to get employees depending upon uh, the, the jobs it has, the staffing it needs, and so forth. So employers in the construction industry have been allowed to sign union agreements without the majority support of employees. But in the Raymond Interior Systems case, you had two unions who were basically fighting over um, claims to the work. The employer had relationships with both of those unions, and in order to cement its uh, ability to perhaps claim more of the work, one of the unions, the, the Carpenters Union, uh, had employees sign cards, and the employer assisted in uh, the union's effort, the Carpenters Union's effort, to get employees to sign cards to confer um, a, uh, a recognition, uh, which uh, went beyond the bounds of the construction industry rule. Uh, in the construction industry, you don't need that majority support. You don't need to uh, have an election. You simply sign the agreement and your relationship lasts for the term of the agreement. Uh, that's Section 8F of the National Labor Relations Act. But under Section 9A, if it is majority-based, based upon uncoerced majority support, the relationship is ongoing even after a contract expires. So because the employer worked with the union to uh, basically uh, pressure employees into signing cards and expressing support for the union um, to create a longer-term relationship. The Labor Board said that was unlawful. Uh, if employees support a union, it needs to come from them, not because an employer is pressuring them to do that. So the Labor Board, uh, in this Raymond decision, actually uh, disestablished the relationship and invalidated the labor agreement that the employer had signed with the Carpenters Union. Uh, the Painters Union complained and the Carpenters Union was basically forced out. So the lesson for um, unions is to make sure that support comes from the employees and that it is not pressured by an employer. The lesson for employers is to respect the rights of choice, yes or no, on union representation. Uh, from employees. Moving to the next case, Apple SoCal. Uh, there was a case from the Labor Board a couple of years ago called Boeing. In the Boeing case, the Labor Board uh, opened the door for employers to uh, revisit their workplace policies, their employee handbooks, and to regulate things such as civility and um, employee speech in the workplace um, and, and other issues which might be addressed by an employee handbook. Um, prior to Boeing, the Labor Board was engaging in deep examination of employer policies and handbooks and declaring many of them to be unlawful. Uh, and uh, this was uh, a, a big change, a big switch for a lot of employers who felt that, you know, what's the Labor Board doing looking at an employee handbook in a non-union workplace? Uh, While well, the Labor Board took a very serious view during that time pre-Boeing on concerted activities, the protections of Section 7, and whether policy language might tend to interfere with uh, employees' rights, whether or not there was actually an employee who was a victim of some sort of adverse activity. Well, Boeing said employers have greater leeway uh, to create and enforce policies so long as yeah, there is not uh, some sort of impact on Section 7 rights. And in Apple, uh, in spite of that uh, opening of a greater opportunity for employers to create, implement, and enforce policies, uh, the employer in Apple SoCal uh, tried to restrict access to the National Labor Relations Board in policy, saying to employees, you can't go there. Well, uh, there's a prior case uh, called U-Haul, which the National Labor Relations Board uh, had, which dealt with uh, 
that sort of restriction, an employer trying to say you cannot go to the National Labor Relations Board if you have an issue, um, perhaps discrimination or interference with your Section 7 rights. The Labor Board said in spite of Boeing, they are going to rule that an effort in policy language to restrict employees' access to NLRB remains unlawful in spite of Boeing. That is something that crosses the line and interferes with employees' rights under federal labor law. Uh, switching gears again, uh, the next slide involves the Ruprecht company. And in Ruprecht, uh, you have the balance between a collective bargaining relationship between an employer and a union where there are mutual duties to bargain in good faith, um, as well as a question under immigration law of participating in E-Verify. Now, uh, those of us who practice in California know that the state of California has its own view on participation in E-Verify, and uh, there are certain, um, you know, certain things that employers need to be mindful of before they embark uh, on uh, use of E-Verify. But important to this discussion regarding Ruprecht is the employer in this collective bargaining relationship unilaterally on its own enrolled in E-Verify without first telling the union. Part of that duty to bargain in good faith, which I mentioned a moment ago, uh, that's regulated by Section 8D of the National Labor Relations Act, is that each party provides notice and an opportunity to discuss before changes are made. If you fail to provide that notice and an opportunity to discuss, it's likely to be considered unlawful. So when the employer unilaterally enrolled in E-Verify, even though the employer uh, contended that, well, we're doing something under federal immigration law, if it's legal compliance, it should be allowed, NLRB said, no, that is a violation. You should have uh, told the union first and talked about it uh, because you did it without doing so, the employer had to rescind the uh, enrollment in E-Verify. So uh, this, is, this is really, I think, important because uh, you may think you're doing something uh, that the law requires. When you're in a bargaining relationship, it is, it, is truly, uh, it is truly a marriage between the employer and the union where the parties need to share information and uh, need to you know, really be made aware. Uh, if there's a situation which is potentially a surprise, best advice is you know, talk about it first. Uh, a really important issue for labor law involves independent contractors, and this is an issue which is coming up in a lot of different contexts. The next slide involves Super Shuttle DFW, uh, which is a decision that came out early in 2019. and. Uh, independent contractor issues have been arising under federal labor law as well as uh, tax law, wage and hour law, employee benefits law, a lot of different wrinkles. And each agency, each court seems to have its own test on uh, what is an independent contractor. The Department of Labor and the National Labor Relations Board have been changing tests from administration to administration. And with Super Shuttle DFW, the Labor Board is basically returning to the common law test for independent contractor status. They overruled a prior ruling, FedEx Home Delivery from 2014 and the Obama administration. And in revising the independent contractor standard, moving away from FedEx, um, the Labor Board in summary says, yeah, we're looking at the common law test to assess independent contractor status. And they put special emphasis on the role of entrepreneurial opportunity. What opportunity does an alleged independent contractor have to engage in business for him or herself and uh, really to uh, be something uh, independent in terms of uh, operations, profitability, uh, customers, and so forth from the entity alleged to be the employer. So pay attention to what the NLRB is doing here. Um, this, this is an interesting uh, development, particularly given that the agency just a year or two ago was looking at uh, the issue of uh, finding an employer to commit an unfair labor practice by the mere act of misclassification. Uh, in other words, you call someone who the labor board views as an employee um, an independent contractor, and that 
designation in and of itself was viewed to be a stripping of uh, the employee's Section 7 rights and an unfair labor practice under the National Labor Relations Act. So I think with Super Shuttle, the agency is showing a, an inclination to move away from that view. Let's move on to the next slide, University of Chicago. This is really just a quick um, point to be made here uh, because from one administration to another, again, not taking sides, but simply pointing out the politics of federal labor law and the National Labor Relations Board, there have been disputes over the years about whether certain employees and certain workplaces are covered by the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, act and within the jurisdiction of the National Labor Relations Board. And uh, there's an issue about whether students, uh, grad students, are uh, employees protected by federal labor law doing work such as teacher's assistants. And in the footnote, the chairman of the NLRB uh, talks about uh, considering when students qualify as employees. Uh, within the meaning of federal labor law. Uh, this is a big question because uh, if they qualify as employees, they would have Section 7 rights. They would have the ability to organize a union. Similar uh, sort of issue with independent contractors. If they're employees, they have those Section 7 rights. They can form and join a union. If they are independent contractors, on the other hand, they are excluded. This same sort of analysis has been kicked around in recent years as it relates to uh, athletes in private colleges and universities under scholarships. It's also being kicked around with regard to charter schools and whether charter schools are employers uh, with employees governed by the National Labor Relations Act. Big issues and we're going to continue to see developments under this administration and future administrations uh, kicking the can back and forth to be honest but having real world impact on these issues. Next slide is Metalcraft of Mayville, uh, which is a uh, recent case uh, from 2019 involving uh, union dues. And uh, we're going to talk about this at a couple different points during this presentation. Uh, union dues and uh, the duty of employees to pay fees and dues to a union uh, is a really hot topic across the country. And you may have heard of a movement uh, called the Right to Work movement, where uh, there are certain opponents to the concept of what they refer to as forced unionism, whether employees should have to pay dues into a union if they choose not to be members and uh, if they are, in fact, represented. So let's say you go to work for an employer that has a labor agreement uh, and you do not wish to be a member. Uh, must you still pay the dues? Um, under federal labor law, uh, there is uh, a duty to continue to pay the dues even if you are not a member because you are represented. Now, uh, under recent Supreme Court authority in the public sector, which is, is not the topic of our presentation, but it should be mentioned, there was a ruling called Janus, which uh, held uh, in the last few months that public sector employees cannot be forced to pay fees and dues for union representation. So it's a voluntary question. Uh, under the National Labor Relations Act, the employees can still be required to pay the dues as a condition of employment. Metalcraft of Mayville supports that. However, um, when a labor agreement expires, uh, the employer was free to discontinue the uh, checkoff, in other words, the payment of dues deducted from employees to the union. Uh, and in this instance, uh, the employer was in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin enacted a right-to-work law. Uh, on a state-by-state -state basis, states can decide whether or not they will allow that forced dues, forced fees uh, in a unionized workplace. And the employer's communications to employees about the dues checkoff were considered lawful rather than unlawful bargaining or what we refer to as uh, unlawful individual direct dealing with employees. So again, there'll be a little bit more on this topic uh, later on. The Kent Hospital case is another case dealing with that mandatory fees and dues. Um, in a union represented workforce governed by the National Labor Relations Act, um, 
you can still be required to pay the fees and dues, but if you are a non-member, uh, you can be uh, what is called financial core status. And in certain instances, employees have said, uh, we do not want to pay for things unrelated to our representation when we pay the fees and dues. Um, as a result of Supreme Court cases going back to the 80s, uh, in particular, communication workers versus Beck, the Supreme Court has told unions that they need to account for what portion of the fees and dues uh, they receive uh, is related to representation as opposed to uh, other sorts of expenses, maybe lobbying or um, things unrelated to representation. So unions have been unhappy about that, having to account and perhaps refund uh, dues and fees money to employees. Um, and in the Kent Hospital case, the Labor Board took it a step further and said that when the union spends money on lobbying uh, on behalf of a, a particular political candidate, that is not a representation expense. It should not be charged to an objecting non-member covered by a fees and dues obligation. So uh, the Labor Board said the union security rules authorize the exaction of only those fees and dues necessary to perform the duty of a bargaining representative. Uh, so uh, this is something that is perhaps going to cause certain employees to speak out, request refunds, and it's going to cause unions to have to do more, uh, more accounting work to figure out um, how much needs to be refunded to an objecting employee. Um, Anheuser-Busch is an important case that uh, came out in May 2019, uh, that's on the next slide, and um, arbitration is a big issue under federal labor law um, as well as under employment law, and there's been um, generally a, a historical presumption in favor of labor arbitration to resolve disputes in the unionized workforce. The development of arbitration in the non-union workforce has has had some uh, separate threads to it and uh, in the last couple of years we've seen rulings uh, from a variety of courts which have uh, embraced concepts such as class action waivers, the U.S. Supreme Court Epic Systems ruling, the California Supreme Court uh, ruling in uh, Iskanian, um, and uh, there, of course, Iskanian has a, a wrinkle where uh, PAGA, Private Attorneys General Act cases, cannot be, uh, or class action uh, waivers are not in, enforceable as to PAGA. So uh, you can waive the class action, but you cannot waive the PAGA under California law and Iskanian. Uh, with Anheuser-Busch, uh, the uh, employer was unionized but all and had a grievance arbitration uh, process uh, described by the collective bargaining agreement but also had uh, an arbitration agreement linked to its job application and the uh, employer sought to compel arbitration um, and the labor board said that that was fine um, and uh, yeah, when, when the employee challenged uh, his termination and the labor board allowed the employer to compel arbitration in court, um, rejecting a national labor relations board charge, that was inappropriate. So uh, we are seeing a, an increased focus on arbitration in the non-union as well as the unionized workplace to resolve disputes outside of court, this being uh, one more case in that regard, Anheuser-Busch. Next slide, Entergy, nuclear operations. I, I think this is an important case simply to point out that uh, in the prior administration, uh, the Labor Board had really expanded employee rights. Cases like Starbucks and Pier 60 uh, showed employees um, going um, to great extremes with profanity and tirades against employers and the labor board concluding that that was protected activity, perhaps provoked by an employer. Uh, it would be considered concerted and a, an employee who was disciplined or discharged uh, might be actually reinstated uh, after a profane tirade. Um, under the Entergy case uh, from 2019, the Labor Board um, 
upheld discipline to an employee who engaged in what the employer considered profane and threatening behavior. So again, remember that the, the uh, labor laws and employee protections under Section 7 have a sliding scale depending upon who is elected, who is in charge. Next slide, Electrolux Home Products. Um, just to, to point out, insubordination has often been viewed as, uh, I, I think, a euphemism for protected activity, you know, particularly with the expansion of rights that we saw a few years ago uh, under Section 7. Uh, and Electrolux stands for the proposition that insubordination is alive and well as a defense, and the discharge was upheld. So, there's lots and lots of disciplinary cases, lots and lots of discharge cases, but I just wanted to point that out because it is a recent ruling and insubordination was an issue that um, the board looked at favorably to the employer. MCPC on the next slide um, deals with the sensitive issue of an employee who accesses confidential information and uh, was uh, fired for it. Now, it's a general rule under Section 7 that employees have the right to discuss wages, hours, and working conditions. They cannot be disciplined for that. Um, it's also a rule under federal uh, federal law and state law, and uh, we, we've seen enactments on that in California uh, where, where state law protects the right to discuss wages. Uh, the analysis differs when it's confidential information. If it is something the employer truly holds as confidential, such as management salary, um, and uh, it, the information is maintained as confidential, uh, an employee may uh, engage in misconduct subject to discipline uh, if that is accessed and disseminated. So MCPC uh, stands for that right of the employer to terminate someone who uh, who accesses and disseminates that information. And uh, in this case, the employee also lied about it. So um, one, one thing that uh, got in the employer's way, however, was that the employer relied on shifting reasons. Um, and if an employer relies on uh, inconsistent or shifting reasons, that can actually undercut the employer's defense. So in, in this case, uh, that affected the ultimate result. When the employer did not maintain uh, the same story during the case, uh, that affected uh, whether the board would honor the defense. So it's, it's important to be consistent when you are handling these cases. Um, even if you have valid grounds, if, if you're changing them, that may impact your defense. MCPC, uh, be mindful of consistent defenses. Next slide, Romer Industries. Uh, this is of interest, uh, particularly if you are uh, an employer who uh, deals a lot with labor law, uh, you need to um, remind your clients to be mindful of their communications uh, because what they say can be used against them. Uh, this is an area of law where it can be unlawful simply to say things uh, or to phrase things in a certain way. Um, many employers who are dealing with labor issues seek counsel and uh, perhaps wanting to do right and, uh, and, and get advice on you know, making the right choice. But if the employer says the wrong thing about that, that can have repercussions as it did in Romer. There were a number of allegations during a union organizing campaign where a union was attempting to become the representative of employees and the employer, proud of hiring their counsel, told employees it hired a union busting lawyer. So. Uh, that in and of itself was viewed as being an unlawful statement. It reflected that uh, the employer uh, did not intend to uh, work with the union. Uh, the labor board takes it very seriously if an employer uh, communicates that they are not going to bargain, if the union is elected, if there is some sort of threat of futility. So this was viewed as such a threat of futility, uh, saying that the company had hired a union busting lawyer. I want to talk about some uh, issues beyond case decisions and uh, one of them has to do with use of email. Um, a few years ago the labor board uh, 
in a ruling called Purple Communications, um, arising uh, from a case in California, said that employees have a presumed right under Section 7 to use employer-provided email for personal reasons and for union activities. And employers have the right to manage and monitor email, uh, provided they take certain steps, but employees would be given that right to communicate over the things that they choose to. Uh, any limitation by an employer would need to be consistent. Well, the current Labor Board under President Trump has said, we want to reassess uh, that rule. And the board in August of 2018 requested uh, briefs uh, on use of employer email in a case involving uh, the Rio uh, Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. And in assessing the Purple Communications standard from 2014, the, uh, the board uh, is, yeah, re has received a lot of commentary and uh, there is no sign as to when a ruling is coming forth. But I think the word uh, to the, the practitioners on this is expect that this will change, expect that this labor board, the current labor board, is going to render a ruling that will be more favorable to employers' ability to regulate uh, the use of email and to limit what employees are allowed to do, particularly as it relates to unions and union organizing. And that will probably also translate over to text messaging, to use of social media, uh, and the repercussions of that remain to be seen. But uh, that will probably come at some time uh, in the next, uh, I would anticipate within the next year, by the end of 2019 most likely, um, and the, the board is, is losing another member toward the end of 2019, and we'll be down to three members unless more are um, appointed and confirmed by the Senate. So uh, the board requires a three-member quorum pursu pursuant to Supreme Court law. Uh, some other uh, noteworthy actions to talk about. Um, in the 2014-2015 period, the National Labor Relations Board enacted rules um, to uh, overhaul the uh, union representation election process. And then in December 2017, the um, Republican majority um, appointed by President Trump posed three questions about the rule changing. Or uh, should the 2014 election rule be retained without change? Should it be re retained with modifications? Or should it be rescinded? Uh, there have been comments uh, filed, many, many comments, and it's expected that the Labor Board will do something to um, either scale back or or scrap the rules that were previously enacted. Um, rules which had uh, sped up the election process substantially. When I worked for the National Labor Relations Board in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, between the time an election was petitioned for at the Labor Board and the time an election was held could be seven weeks. Um, during the Clinton administration, uh, it was more like five to six weeks. And currently, uh, the time frame between an election petition and the vote itself uh, is frequently uh, about 23 or 24 days. Uh, so you know, you're a little over three weeks and sometimes less, sometimes as few as maybe 10 days. Um, that is a big difference. And uh, depending on who you represent, uh, employees and unions or employers, that time can make a big difference. Uh, the the time uh, can be, even if it's a longer period, can be very disruptive for a business uh, as well as for employees. So um, employers want more time, unions and employees typically want less to get to the vote and to get a result. So uh, another issue, uh, arising under those representation rule changes uh, is blocking charges. In other words, uh, what is the impact on an election case, uh, an election that is scheduled if an employer or union files a charge saying that there's been some sort of unlawful activity? Uh, it was historically the case that the filing of a charge might actually stop and derail the election. And 
um, the rules that were enacted a few years ago uh, do not automatically do that and require that a party uh, wishing to block an election file a request and an offer of proof. So this is something that the Labor Board is also going to review. Another very hot topic at the Labor Board is joint employer status. Moving on to the next slide. And <clears throat> with joint employer status, uh, you have a question of uh, multiple employers, perhaps um, employers in a joint venture, um, a general contractor and a subcontractor, um, a, um, a company and a staffing company uh, working together, being held to shared liabilities for unlawful conduct or potentially even being held to a joint bargaining relationship with a labor union which has organized a pool of workers who work for both entities. Uh, there was a case the labor board came out with a few years ago called Browning Ferris Industries and that case has been really the focal point for discussion on on this issue whether the labor board should rely on um, what uh, what they termed either actual control of both employers or potential control by both employers to confer joint employer liability and obligations so this is an issue under consideration by the labor board um, comments were filed on proposed rules and uh, the NLRB chairman has been communicating about this uh, with a statement in January 2019. Next slide, a, a letter from the chairman um, from March 2019 uh, to committee chairs in Congress uh, about joint employer rulemaking. Nearly 29,000 comments came in on this joint employer issue because it concerns many people, uh, both businesses as well as labor unions. Uh, in fact, the board uh, itself has hired temporary staff to assist in reviewing the comments uh, because they are part of the public record and they are, um, it, it is important that the Labor Board as a federal agency consider the input that, um, that uh, the public has on these important issues. So on to the next slide. Um, I mentioned with the Raymond Interior Systems case, uh, the um, difference between construction industry bargaining relationships which are contract to contract and majority uh, employee support bargaining relationships uh, typical of other industries under section 9a um, the labor board has for many years uh, prosecuted employers in the construction industry when they uh, when they consider a labor agreement to have expired and they cease recognizing the union uh, because many times unions have inserted uh, clauses in the labor agreements which say that a majority of employees want the union to represent them when there may be actually no evidence to support that so <clears throat> that issue of uh, whether boilerplate language can confer a long-term bargaining relationship which exceeds the term of an expired construction labor agreement. Uh, it, it's something that concerns the Labor Board right now. Uh, I actually handled the Colorado fire sprinkler case mentioned on this slide where the District of Columbia Circuit said that such clauses, such action by the board to enforce a bargaining relationship after a construction agreement expires is unlawful and runs afoul of employees' rights of choice under Section 7. So the Labor Board is looking at that issue and whether to uh, revisit the Staunton Fuel uh, case from 2001, which was at the Labor Board level uh, they were relying on to try to enforce that sort of contract language. Bottom line from all of this, the Labor Board rescinded the invitation to file briefs when the union involved in the Lowshaw case mentioned on the slide said they did not want to proceed uh, with a decision from the board. I think they felt they were going to lose in front of the Trump NLRB and they withdrew their charge. So uh, while, while this Lowshaw case is technically gone and dead, I think it is a reminder to parties if you're dealing with the construction industry and these sorts of issues that um, this is an issue which could resurrect uh, in a new case posing similar issues. Uh, some more noteworthy actions to think about hot topics affecting labor law. Um, 
whether or not unions um, have access to the workplace. Uh, there's a list here on this next slide, uh, whether um, union agents can have access to a non-union workplace. Um, and uh, there, there's been dialogue between some, but not all of the NLRB members. And there's been a bit of controversy over that reported in Bloomberg Law. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, in May 2019, there was an announcement about the NLRB's rulemaking agenda, um, revisiting that they intend to uh, look at the election case procedures, uh, blocking charges, um, the formation of bargaining relationships in the workplace, um, whether students are employees under the jurisdiction of the National Labor Relations Board and access, as I mentioned. So this has been reaffirmed very recently. Um, and then uuh, some other hot topics have been addressed in what the National Labor Relations Board refers to on the next slide uh, as advice memoranda. Uh, if you've worked with the National Labor Relations Board, um, you, you probably know that uh, there are case decisions that are authoritative and change from administration to administration. There are regulations on some, but not all topics. Uh, NLRB has not been very prolific in creating regulations, but there are some that you need to be mindful of. Um, there are also advice memoranda, which are essentially topical case-oriented discussions where there is perhaps a cutting edge issue or an issue where the agency uh, may be looking at switching gears, pursuing a different type of analysis or result. And in this instance, there is a question about banners and inflatables. And uh, you ask, what are banners? What are inflatables? Well, in uh, in under labor law, uh, we see that unions often engage in uh, forms of communication, protest, such as picketing, where uh, where there are demonstrators who carry signs, who perhaps um, uh, walk in a certain area. Uh, Another way that uh, they communicate with the public is with stationary banners, uh, which you may see uh, where you are, things that say such things such as shame on, uh, you know, name the business for undermining labor conditions. Uh, banners say a number of different things, perhaps the same thing that a picket sign might say, but rather than being carried by someone walking around, it is stationary. Uh, the question has arisen whether banners are unlawful, and the Labor Board years ago, um, as well as the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, said they distinguish banners from picketing. They consider picketing to be potentially unlawful because it is confrontational with the patrolling around. Uh, while stationary banners are not, they are simply communication in the realm of um, non-confrontational free speech, even if the message is the same. And, and then there are inflatables. You may have seen inflatable rats or cats or uh, other animals uh, which are uh, used to represent perhaps a targeted employer that a union uh, is uh, speaking out about. And uh, again, the inflatables have been considered to be non-confrontational because they are not patrolling or moving around. Well, in May 2019, NLRB issued the advice memorandum uh, in the case of IBEW Local 134 and directed prosecution of the labor union because of the banner and the inflatable, uh, saying that they felt it was a violation of Section 8B4, which is a section regulating union picketing and threats thereof, uh, particularly in this instance where it is attempting to pressure one employer uh, by um, by going to uh, perhaps a customer or uh, a third party that that employer does business with. Um, and the Labor Board took the view that in this advice memo that even if the conduct is not picketing, it is viewed as coercive and knowingly false uh, labor and commercial speech receiving less protection under the First Amendment. So this is is really something that um, I think is at odds with the Ninth Circuit ruling and uh, the Eliason and Newth ruling involving the Carpenters Union from the Labor Board a few years ago. 
uh, and we will see where this develops. But this is a hot topic and warrants attention if you are dealing with any demonstration activity. Uh, I mentioned independent contractor misclassification, and these days it's hard to uh, touch on those issues without going to something in the gig economy involving Uber or Lyft. And of course, there is an advice memorandum involving Uber on, on the next slide, uh, which applies the Super Shuttle DFW standard, which I mentioned a few slides ago, and emphasizes the company's control, the uh, common law test, and entrepreneurial opportunity as factors to determine whether someone is truly an independent contractor versus an employee. And in the Uber case, the drivers at issue were found to be independent contractor rather than employees. And and I and just reminder that Department of Labor, state laws, depending upon the subject matter, they may all differ. So you, you could have different results on independent contractor uh, misclassification questions, depending on you know who you're dealing with, NLRB or otherwise. Um, Want to talk about uh, some general counsel memorandum. Uh, discussion on different issues that I think is important to know about if you handle uh, National Labor Relations Board uh, election cases. Uh, Memorandum 1806 talks about motions to intervene by petitioners and employees. In the past, the Labor Board was mostly inclined to allow the employer and the union to participate in proceedings involving a workplace election. Uh, perhaps less inclined to allow individual employees um, or petitioners to have a seat at the table in a hearing um, or to be involved in the discussion uh, on the course of the case. Well, uh, pursuant to this August 2018 memorandum, uh, the Labor Board uh, was going to provide more of an open door and not oppose motions uh, by proposed interveners uh, to make sure that there are more people uh, with a stake in the matter allowed to participate. Moving on to the next slide, uh, a memorandum uh, regarding uh, Section 8B1A. That is a charge that is typically filed against a labor union for interfering in the rights of employees. And uh, it really signaled that the Labor Board was looking to enforce the law um, more strictly against unions, particularly uh, if a union represents employees and is neglectful or non-communicative. Let's say an employee has filed a grievance and the union does not get back to the employee. Uh, or the union takes action affecting the employee and doesn't respond to questions. Uh, these are the sorts of things um, neglect which might have been excusable in the past which the labor board now intends to prosecute so there is an open door for charges on these issues that was not there under the prior administration next slide general counsel memorandum 1902 reducing case processing time this is a bit of a quandary because the labor board wants to do things faster according to this memorandum of december 2018 they want to do more in less time they want to uh, develop uniformity, but they are also allowing regional discretion from office to office on what will work best. So I think what you should expect is that there will be pressure to do things faster, uh, perhaps less inclination to grant you an extension if you request more time to respond on an investigation. Um, I don't know that that will promote uniformity. Uh, you will probably see differences from one office to another, which uh, if you're like me and practice in many different NLRB offices, you already do notice that there are differences in practice from one office to the other. So that, that will continue. Next slide, General Counsel Memorandum 1903, uh, deferral. Uh, it's important to note that if you have a labor agreement with a grievance arbitration process, that uh, the Labor Board has tried over the years to respect that grievance arbitration process to <clears throat> resolve disputes that arise um, rather than um, allow parties to get uh, bound up in unfair labor practice charges. So let's say someone gets fired, there's a just cause standard and a grievance procedure under the labor agreement, let's let that grievance process work rather than running through a full-blown NLRB investigation and trial. 
That changed a bit under the Obama administration where uh, they would allow the grievance to go forward. The labor board was also investigating and prosecuting such cases and uh, an accused employer might be fighting the same battle in two forums. Well, the the labor board now is uh, reconsidering all of that. And in the 1903 memorandum here uh, from December 2018, uh, it, it speaks with, uh, with regard to an applicable grievance arbitration procedure being allowed to address an issue that um, you know, arises in an unfair labor practice context. So there is greater uh, interest in letting the agreed upon mechanism um, do uh, what it can to resolve the dispute and to, to require the labor board to defer uh, its actions um, in light of that process. Next slide, Memorandum 1904, a 2019 memorandum on uh, the issue of union dues and fees. And uh, a union now has more of a spelled out duty to notify employees of their rights to uh, uh, not be members to um, to uh, not pay dues uh, through their paychecks and uh, to uh, spell out you know whether employees uh, wish to be a union member or not. Uh, there there's a lot more disclosure that must be provided, and uh, this came out just days before the ruling in the Kent Hospitals case, which I mentioned a few slides ago. Next slide. Operations Management uh, Memorandum 1905, which uh, is uh, with regard to uh, if you are an accused party and you do not cooperate uh, with the NLRB's investigation. Typically, a charge is filed, an agent is assigned, and that agent will reach out and say, these are the allegations, please provide a response, make a witness available uh, for a sworn testimony in an affidavit, things such as that. And uh, what the Labor Board is saying here is if you do not provide uh, cooperation, uh, if you simply send a letter and deny the allegations or you don't respond at all, the Labor Board is going to note that in uh, in the complaint that follows if the case is prosecuted. And my guess is uh, that is uh, going to be argued as a signal to the judges that the Labor Board is uh, doing the best it can to make a, um, a well-rounded neutral decision before it prosecutes. But there's another angle to this that uh, if, let's say, an accused employer uh, wins at trial uh, after not cooperating, the Labor Board may have a defense to fee applications that might be filed. Fees are rarely granted in NLRB cases uh, based on the standard of the Equal Access to Justice Act, but it is an option and cooperation is a factor that the Labor Board looks at. So um, another point I want to bring out is um, on the volume of NLRB cases. Uh, unions have not been as energized to go to the NLRB since President Trump took office, since he appointed the, uh, the persons who have been confirmed to the board and the general counsel. And that has been reflected statistically in the number of charges that have been filed. And uh, it's been published in Bloomberg Law. The number of unfair labor practice, or ULP, charges is down 11% uh, since President Trump took office. And many unions are, uh, frankly, uh, very open about they are choosing their battles more carefully. Uh, where they might have filed charges um, in, uh, in the past, they are being more selective um, because they don't want to develop bad law. Uh, they, uh, there is actually a, a belief that filing charges may be dangerous uh, by some unions if um, the issue is one, something that attracts the attention of the current NLRB. So that is a, um, a question I, I think we all deal with, you know, do we want to pick our battles uh, and, uh, you know, are, are, are some issues more valuable than others to raise? And, and that is one that is certainly getting consideration these days with NLRB. Um, just generally looking at case handling numbers, you can see that the volume of cases has, has changed. 
uh, the number of charges and complaints has gone down um, to the extent that um, there are uh, cases determined to have merit. Uh, there are a lot, a lot of settlements. Most NLRB cases where merit is found uh, do settle, and that is historically consistent with um, with NLRB's uh, case handling uh, practice and success in getting resolution. Uh, with election petitions on the next slide, um, you'll see that uh, the numbers are also down, and that's in spite of the uh, change in election rules a few years ago, which the Obama administration very openly uh, enacted to encourage more elections and more union organizing activity. So even though the number of elections is down, the union's winning percentage continues uh, to be high. Unions win uh, close to 70% of the elections that are held uh, in the workplace. Um, when the NLRB's own internal administrative processes are not enough to resolve an unfair labor practice. Uh, on the next slide, Memorandum 1805, the Labor Board has the authority to go into federal court to seek injunctions under uh, Section 10J of the National Labor Relations Act uh, because uh, in the Labor Board's view, uh, yeah, standard remedies do not suffice and interim relief is needed until the board can achieve an appropriate ruling. So the Labor Board in Memorandum 1805, General Counsel Memorandum 1805, has committed to continue to pursue Section 10J relief uh, under the Trump administration. Uh, the Obama administration, NLRB, was very active in pursuing Section 10J proceedings, and uh, they want to consider these issues before an unfair labor practice trial rather than after. Moving to the next slide with the chart, uh, you'll see that um, the the number of authorizations um, has been high. Many cases uh, settle when uh, 10J petitions uh, are authorized by the board. A regional office requests approval from DC to do this, and uh, you'll see that in spite of this commitment, uh, the number uh, or, or the 2018 uh, numbers are definitely lower than what we've seen in the past. So there are fewer Section 10J uh, cases that are going forward, uh, and perhaps part of that has to do with the lower volume of charges being filed, but uh, th this is certainly a, a um, potent weapon that the Labor Board has to resolve unfair labor practice issues, um, you know, query whether the numbers will go up in a different administration. So there's a lot of talk about structural changes at the National Labor Relations Board, and uh, that that has been definitely a part of the Trump administration's um, approach to uh, the agency. Um, and looking at the framework, uh, do they need as many regional offices as they uh, as they have? Uh, should they consolidate regional offices? Should they close certain offices um, or reconstitute the regions that? Uh, uh, that have been in operation for a certain period of time. Um, Alaska's office closed. Uh, there is no NLRB office in Alaska anymore, uh, and cases have to be handled through Seattle. So um, you know, th this could have um, significant impact on on people depending upon where they are. But um, the the agency has communicated that they are continuing to look at potential structural changes. This has been reported, and. There is uh, insurrection, uh, to be honest, uh, within the NLRB. Uh, staff uh, have expressed concerns about their ability to do the job. Uh, the National Labor Relations Board's own internal union, the NLRBU, has uh, certainly expressed discontent with the potential structural changes, the impact on employees of the agency itself. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, unpaid interns. Uh, unpaid interns have raised a lot of issues in a variety of contexts, wage hour, benefits, um, and uh, it, it's often a, a dangerous, risky um, sort of uh, arrangement if it's not done correctly, and uh, it's an issue that has arisen before the National Labor Relations Board as well, whether or not unpaid interns are employees under the National Labor Relations uh, Board our, our National Labor Relations Act uh, enforceable by the National Labor Relations Board. And in the Amnesty International case, uh, which 
has a uh, administrative law judge's decision um, from uh, 2019, uh, there was a ruling that unpaid interns are employees and that the words and actions of Amnesty International were words and actions of an employer uh, constituting unfair labor practices. Um, this is uh, something which is pending with the uh, Trump appointed NLRB in Washington DC right now. So we will see um, how the uh, agency comes out um, in review of this judge's decision. Uh, so again, uh, the scope of the law, who is considered to be an employee uh, will vary depending upon who is in charge. Uh, next slide, worker centers. This is another issue. Many times labor unions um, are at the focal uh, point of National Labor Relations Board issues. Uh, we've seen in, in the labor relations field um, a greater presence of um, organizations calling themselves worker centers and um, claiming they are not labor unions, but often um, speaking on behalf of workers um, in uh, a variety of ways. And uh, the Labor Board, as well as the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, are looking at these worker centers to see, are they, uh, in uh, the view of those respective agencies, um, an alternative or substitute for unions? Should they be regulated by the same laws and regulations which regulate labor unions, which require annual reporting and so forth? So. Uh, if you are uh, familiar with worker centers or dealing with them in some way, uh, be mindful that the Labor Board will likely be speaking more about this, and uh, this has been reported in, uh, in a couple of recent places, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, as well as um, Bloomberg. So uh, another issue to track. I have covered a lot of stuff in the time we have been uh, here together, and that concludes my comments for today. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about this. Uh, my contact information is on uh, this, uh, this slide. Uh, and I, I welcome any inquiries uh, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you very much.